From here, since we have been having the problem um, on Sunday, if I, you got to take it so let me let me get with you after we get to, oh, okay, okay, <laughs> I got you.
Good morning, everyone. I'm Brother Metlock, the minister of the U.S. 19 Church of Christ, and we want to welcome you to our um, morning worship service that's held every Sunday morning at 1030. Also, we want to wish all of our mothers a happy Mother's Day, and definitely this is your day. We want you to enjoy it, and we hope and pray you put all of those bad things out of your mind, like the coronavirus and all of those other things, people being sick and people out of work and all of that stuff. Just just focus on the fact that today is your day. So again, happy Mother's Day from the U.S. 19 Church of Christ. And as being members of the New Testament Christians, we should speak what the Bible speaks, and we should be silent what the Bible is silent. We believe that we should call Bible things by Bible names and do Bible things in Bible ways. We believe, as Jesus said in John 4 and verse 24, that God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And with that in mind, first of all, we know that most, if not all of our members have had an opportunity to come by the building and to drop off your contribution and also to pick up a communion packet. And also, if you did not get an opportunity to do that, don't forget that from Tuesday through Friday, from 9 o'clock to 3 o'clock, you can come by, pick up your communion packet, also make your contribution here at the building in the drop box and also you can pick up a, a Wednesday Bible class we're on a new lesson dealing with doubt distrust and disbelief so make sure you do those three things if at all possible so that when we get ready for our worship service and our Wednesday Bible study you're ready to go and with that in mind we're going to ask you to bow as I lead you in a word of prayer in behalf of the monies that have been given toward the kingdom and the growth of the kingdom here at the U.S. 19 Church of Christ. Let us pray. Righteous Father, we're so thankful that you are God and, and we're your children. And Father, you've been better to us than we've been to ourselves. And we're truly thankful. And just now, Father, we thank you for those who had an opportunity to give towards the, the work here. We pray, Father, that we would use these monies that have been given toward the upbuilding of our kingdom and that the winning of souls to be because, Father, we know that the winning of souls is the first and foremost duty of the church. Bless us, Father, and help us to continue to look to you, who is truly the author and the finish of our faith. For we ask this through our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us all say, Amen. At this time now, we're going to sing a song, 
and we've already sent the song out on the uh, texting. Uh, it's the Glory Land way. I'm in the Glory Land way. We're going to sing the first and the last stanza of that song, the Glory Land way. Okay, if you have the song, or if you know it, we're going to ask you to join right in with us. I'm in the way, the bright and shining way. Uh, I'm in the glory land, glory land way. I'm telling the world that Jesus saved today. Yes, I'm in the glory land, glory land way. I'm in the glory land, glory land way. Uh, I'm in the glory land, glory land way. And heaven is dearer and the way grow clearer for I'm in the glory land, glory land way. Uh, onward I go rejoicing in his love. And I'm in the glory land, glory land way. And soon I shall see him in that home above. Oh, I'm in the glory land, glory land way. I'm in the glory land, glory land way. And I'm in the glory land, glory land way. And heaven is dearer and the way grow clearer for. I'm in the glory land, glory land way. Now let us bow again as I lead us in a word of prayer. Eternal Father, we come to thee again. And we pray, Father, that as we bow before thy presence, that we will continue to recognize that thou art God and there is none beside thee. Lord God, you are the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. And Father, we know that even though we are going through trials and tribulations just now, not only in our country, not only in our state, not only in our city, but in the world, we pray, Father, that you would help us all to understand that regardless of the circumstances, that you are still a bridge over troubled water. Bless us, Father, as we go through this Mother's Day and that we will continue to understand that even though times are difficult, it is in those times that you do your greatest work with us and with the world. For we ask this through our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us all say amen. Now we come to another part of the worship service, which is the Lord's Supper. The Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through about verse 29 these words for i received of the lord that which also i delivered unto you that the lord jesus the same night in which he was betrayed is his bread and when he had given thanks he break it and said take ye, this is my body which is broken for you this do in remembrance of me after the same manner also he took the cup and when he had supped saying this cup is the new testament in my blood this do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself not discern the Lord's body. First of all, let us pray for the bread. Eternal Father, we come to thee in behalf of this bread, which represents that son's broken body. We pray, Father, that as we partake of it, we would do so the way the scripture teaches. In Jesus' name we pray. Let us all say amen. You may partake of the bread. Now let us pray for the cup. Eternal Father, we come to thee again in behalf of this cup that represents the blood that was shed on the tree of the cross for the remission of sins of the world. We pray, Father, that as we partake of the cup, we will do so the way the scripture teaches. In Jesus' name we pray. Let us all pray. Amen. Now you may partake of the cup. And after the Lord suffered the disciples unto him and went out unto the Mount of Olives. Now, if you have your Bible, would you turn to 1 Kings 
chapter 3, verses 16, starting at verse 16, and we're going to read to about verse number 28. Again, that's the book of 1 Kings, chapter 3, verses 16 through about verse number 28. And I will be reading now the King James Version. Again, that's 1 Kings. Chapter 3, verses 16 through verse number 28. And we find these words. Then came there two women that were harlots unto the king and stood before him. And the one woman said, O oh my Lord, I and this woman dwelt in one house. And I was delivered of a child with her in the house. And it came to pass the third day after that I was delivered, that this woman was delivered also. And we were together, there was no strangers with us in the house, except we two in the house. And this woman's child died in the night because she overlaid it. And she arose at midnight and took my son from beside me. And while thine handmaid slept, and laid it in her bosom, and laid her dead child in my bosom. And when I arose in the morning to give my child suck, behold, it was dead. But when I had considered it in the morning, behold, it was not my son, which I did bear. And the other woman said, Nay, but the living is my son, and the dead is thy son. And this said, No, but my dead is not son is not thy son, and the living is my son. Thus they spake before the king. Then said the king, the one said, This is my son that liveth, and thy son is the dead. And the other said it, Nay, but my thy son is the dead, and my son is the living. Notice they're going back and forth, which son is the dead one and which son is the live one, who is the mother of the dead and the, and, the alive, and the one that's alive. And the king said, now watch this, bring me a sword. And they brought a sword before the king. And the king said, divide the living child in two and give half to the one and half to the other. Then spake the woman who the living child was unto the king. For her bowels yearned upon her son. And she said, O oh my Lord, give her the living child, and in no wise slay it. But the other said, Let it be hither, nor mine nor hers, but divide it. Then the king answered and said, Give her the living child, and in no wise slay it. She is the mother thereof, or in other words, the real mother. And all Israel heard of the judgment which the king had judged. And they feared the king, for they saw that the wisdom of God was in him to do judgment. We would like for everyone to repeat verses 24 through 28 after me. And the king said, Bring me a sword. And they brought a sword before the king. And the king said, Divide the living child in two, and give half to the one, and half to the other. Then spake the woman who the living child was unto the king, for her bowels yearned upon her son. And she said, O oh my Lord, give her the living child, and in no wise slay it. But the other said, Let it be neither mine nor thine, but divide it. Then the king answered and said, Give her the living child, and in no wise slay it. She is the mother thereof. And all Israel heard of the judgment which the king had judged. And they feared the king, for they saw that the wisdom of God was in him to do judgment. And may the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word 
and to the hearers as well. I want to ask you a question this morning as I start this lesson. Whenever you hear the phrase, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world, what do you think of? Again, whenever you hear the phrase, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world, what do you think of? Now, there may be some who are thinking, well, Brother Metlock, I think that phrase is saying that women should take care of their children. Now, that's true. It's, it's children, her children. But that's not what that phrase is saying. Then there may be some who say, well, Brother Metlock, maybe that phrase is saying mothers are the best one between the mother and the father that should take care of their children. Now, that's true also, but that's not what that phrase is saying. Then there are those who may be saying, well, Brother Metlock, I think that phrase is saying that uh, a woman should not work, but she should be at home taking care of her children. Now, to a large extent, many can do that and many can't do that. But that's not what this phrase is saying. Now, listen real close. When you hear the phrase, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world, this statement is actually emphasizing that the person, whether it's a male or female, that is taking care of the children, let's say 80 to 90% of the time, they have a tremendous amount of responsibility and the opportunity is there for them to influence that child in such a way that it can actually, that influence can go on and influence the world. In other words, they can mature that child and teach that child principles. But now here's the thing about that phrase. They can be either be good or bad. One prominent writer said this, Motherhood is the preeminent force for change in the world, for good or bad. Did you hear that? Let me say it again. Motherhood, the writer said, is, notice now, motherhood is the preeminent force for change in the world, but it can be either good or bad. And the reason is because Mothers spend the most time with their children before they are born and after they are born. And actually, even the Word of God, God expects the mother to be a very important factor in the lives of the children. Turn, if you will, to Titus chapter 2. Notice what the Apostle Paul wrote. Titus chapter 2, verse 3 through verse 5. The aged women likewise that they be in behavior as becoming holiness, not false accusers, not giving them much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. So here even Paul is saying that women and mothers in particular have a tremendous amount of responsibility. But now, notice this now. In our lesson this morning, we want to emphasize the importance of not just being a mother. You see, any woman can have children, but that does not make her a good mother. Now, let me say that again. Any female, any woman can have children. But that does not make that female or that woman a good mother. And what we're going to see today in our lesson is that there is a difference between a good mother and a bad mother. And it's important to stipulate that because oftentimes it goes that way even with the father. Father's Day come and a man may be the worst person in the world. But he said, well, you know, on Father's Day, uh, I ought to be honored by my children and about those that know me and love me because I'm a father. Well, 
just because you had children or you have children, it does not make you a good father. And by the same token, just because a woman has children, it does not make her a good mother. So in our lesson today, I want us to use the principle that the Apostle Paul talked about in Philippians chapter 12 and verse number 2. Turn now in Philippians chapter 12 and verse number 2. The Apostle Paul, he says something about a potter with clay. And believe it or not, a mother has that same responsibility. It's been given by God. Look at Philipp, uh, Romans, rather, Romans, I may have said Philippians, but Romans chapter 12, verse number 2. Watch what the Word of God will tell us. And this is the principle I want all of us to think about as we go through this lesson today. And be not trans and be and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now what Paul is talking about there is a potter as he takes the clay and as he molds and shapes the clay into a plate or a pot or whatever he's trying to mold it into. He's shaping and molding that plate, that pot, that, that utensil, whatever it may be. He's molding it and shaping it from the clay. Well, believe it or not, mothers have that same responsibility of shaping and molding. And so today we want to look at the actual fight that mothers have the future, the actual future of the child in their hands, like that potter has the future of that plate or that pot in the palm of his hand. So as we think about the fact that mothers are molding and shaping and training their children, this is what our lesson will be concerning this morning. Now, the lesson itself is divided into three parts. Number one, we want to explain the subject that we have. Number two, we want to notice the difference between a good mother and a bad mother. And then last of all, we want to look at what can a mother do to make sure that she is the right, she has the right kind of influence that will shape and mold that child that will have a positive influence in the world. So as we look at 1 Kings chapter 3, we want to preach from the subject on this Mother's Day in 2020, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. Did you hear that? The hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. Now, first of all, Brother Metlock, what do you mean by the subject, the hand that rocks the cradle move, rules the world? Well, we want to break it down into three parts. There are three principles I want you to notice in this subject that we have this morning. Number one, the first principle is this. We understand. It says, the hand that rocks. Stop right there. The hand that rocks. Now, this phrase, this principle, is in reference to the mother. Now, it could be the father if there's a single father. But basically, it's talking about the mother. Look, if you will, at Proverbs chapter 1, verse 8 and 9. In the book of Proverbs chapter 1, verse 8 and verse 9, the Bible says this, My son, hear the instructions of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother. For they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head, and chains about thy neck. Did you hear that? Mothers and fathers. So it could be one or the other. But most of the time, it's the mother. There's a passage I want you to notice in the book of Titus. Remember when we read Titus? It says the older women are to teach the younger women how to take care of their husband, how to take care of the house, how to train their children. But also, notice this in Ephesians chapter 6. The Apostle Paul wrote this in Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 4. Watch what the Word of God will tell us here. In Ephesians 6 and verse number 4, the Bible says this. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Now, the Apostle Paul used the word father there in a generic sense. He's saying not only males, but females. And what are they to do, Brother Metlock? 
They're to bring up the children in the nurture. The word nurture literally means discipline. Discipline, he's saying mothers and fathers, discipline your children. And then he uses the word admonition. This word means to train in the original language. So what Paul is saying here is that when it comes to the hand that rocks, it could be a male or a female, but most of the time it's the female, the mother. Then the second principle in this phrase, in this subject we have, the cradle. Now, Brother Metlock, what is a cradle? Young people, watch this. A cradle refers to a small bed-type wooden object that babies lie in to either sleep or to be quiet in as, as they are around the family. Now, Jesus was born, and he was kept in for a little time. In The Bible tells us in Luke chapter 2 and verse 12, in a feeding trough. A manger. That's a feeding, it's a, it's, a, it's a container where animals would eat out of. Jesus was in a manger, a feeding trough. But a cradle refers to a wooden object that babies are in. It has a rocker, a one rock on either side that rocks the baby to keep the baby quiet. So notice so far, the hand that rocks the cradle. Now, look at the third principle. Rules the world. Rules the world. What do you mean now, Brother Metlock? What we're talking about is that the mother in particular, see, she is in a situation that she can give good influence and teach influence and mold that child in such a way that when that child gets older, that child can stand in life and do things that are positive. Give or have a good influence in the world and that those who are following that child they can look back and follow the paper trail back to when that when that young man or that young lady was a baby how that how that mother instilled into them those good principles those good qualities that god's word is teaching that's what we mean by rule the world but it can go in the opposite direction now let me show you what i mean by putting in some positive thing that can affect a child later on in life. Let me ask you a question. If I ask you who were the first three kings of the Israelite nation that each one of them ruled for 40 years, you would probably tell me Saul, David, and Solomon. And you would be right. They were Saul, David, and Solomon. But in 1 Kings, Chapter 1 and 2. If it had not been for a mother who was named Bersheba, you and I would be saying the three kings of the Israelite nation was Saul, David, and Adonijah. What are you talking about, Brother Bentlock? Turn, if you will, to the book of 1 Kings, chapter 2. Now, we started out 1 Kings, chapter 3, but I want you to know that 1 Kings, chapter 2, and I want you to know this. In particular, 1 Kings chapter 2, I'm going to start at about verse 19. Bersheba therefore went into the king Solomon to speak unto him for Adonijah. And the, and the king rose up to meet her, and bowed himself unto her, and sat down on his throne, and caused a, a seat to be set for the king's mother. And she sat on his right hand. Now watch this now. Then she said, I desire one small petition of thee. I pray thee. Say me not nay. And the king said unto her, Ask on my mother, for I will not say thee nay. And she said, Let Abishad the Shulamite be given unto Adonijah thy brother to wife. And King Solomon answered and said unto his mother, that is Bathsheba, who was really not his mother, he called her mother. And why dost thou ask Abishad the Shulamite for Adonijah? As for him, the kingdom also, for he is my elder brother, or son, that's what he's saying, even for him, and for Apatar the priest, and Joab the son of Zerah. Then King Solomon swear by the Lord, saying, God do so to me, and more also, if Adonijah have not spoken this word against his own life. What are you trying to say, Brother Metlock? David had four sons. 
He showed a little favoritism with Absalom because he loved Absalom more than the other three. But Absalom was dead. And all of a sudden now, Adonijah felt like it was his time to become king. Because David was old and senile and he was lying in his bed. But Bathsheba, the mother, she said, like, you know, Solomon needs to be king. And Adonijah had gone so far, and brother and sister, you can check this in, in the text. He had gone so far, he was having a feast that day that he might be anointed the third king of Israel. But Bathsheba went to David and said, David, do you know what's going on? David did, brother and sister, David didn't even know what was going on until she brought it to his attention. And after she brought it to his attention, and he wanted to please Bathsheba. He anointed Solomon that same day, the third king of Israel. Watch this. Solomon became king because Bathsheba went to David and brought it to his attention what Adonijah was doing. That's why today when somebody asks you who is the three kings of the Israelite nation, Saul, David, and Solomon. You see, brother and sister, what I'm saying? The hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. But now, watch this. Let's make sure that the rocker is a good mother and not a bad mother. D did you hear that? We need to make sure whoever is doing the rocking, make sure that person is a good person and not a bad person. Well, what do you mean by that, Brother Metlock? Look at Mark chapter 6. In the book of Mark chapter 6, verses 17 through 28. Look at this account in the New Testament. In the book of Mark chapter 6. That was a, a man by the name of Herod. He was having a birthday party. In Mark chapter 6, verses 17 through 28. The Bible says this. Mark 6. But Herod himself had hold upon John and bound him in prison for Herodias sake his brother Philip's wife for he had married her now watch this but John had said unto Herod it is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife therefore Her Herodias had a quarrel against John and would have killed him but she could not for Herod feared John knowing that he was a just man and a holy and observed him and when he had heard him he did many things and heard him gladly. Now watch this. And when a convenient day was come, and Herod was on his birthday, he made a supper to his Lord, high captains and chief estates of Galilee. And when the daughter of the said Herodias came in and danced and pleased Herod and them that sat with him, watch this now, and the damsel said unto, and the king said unto the damsel, Ask of me whatsoever thou wilt, and I will give it to thee. And he swear unto her, Whatsoever thou shalt ask of me, I will give it to thee, even half of my kingdom. Now watch this. And she, Herodias, well, the young lady who was dancing, rather, she went forth and said unto her mother, What shall I ask? And her mother said, Ask for the, John, the head of John the Baptist. And she came in, and straightway, watch it now, hastened to the king and asked, saying, I will that thou would give me by and by in a charger the head of John the Baptist. And the king was exceedingly sorrow, yet for his own oath's sake and for their sake, which sat with him, he would not reject her. And here this man went and had John's head cut off. And this woman, this young lady, brought that head, the head of John the Baptist, to her mother. You see, I made a statement earlier. Make sure that the hand that's doing the rocking is a good person and not a bad person who has developed some bad influence from those who were doing the rocking. So point number one, make sure the rocker is a good person and not a bad. Now that we've seen now what the 
phraseology the subject is about. Let's now let's notice the difference in a good mother and a bad mother. A good mother and a bad mother. Well, Brother Mitla, what's the difference? First of all, there is such a thing as a good mother and a bad mother. Well, what do you mean, Brother Mitla? Watch this. And before I get into this, I want you to, I, this is my personal feeling. I'm giving my personal feelings right now. I believe, without a shadow of a doubt, just, that's me, Brother Metlock talking, that we have about 80 to 85 percent of good mothers in the United States. I just honestly believe that. But it's the 15 to 20 percent you have to watch out for. Now, in this lesson, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scriptures give my inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished in all good works. Now, the reason I quoted that scripture is I want you to know that as I preach this lesson on Mother's Day, 99.9% .9 of what I'm going to say is from the Word of God. That that one percent is what you just heard. That I believe, in terms of the percentage, it's about 80 to 85 percent. That's that's my opinion. Now that I've gotten rid of that one percent, that 99 percent of what I'm dealing with in this lesson. It's not what Brother Metlock is saying. It's what the Word of God is actually teaching. Now, notice now, let me give you an example of a good mother and a bad mother. Remember the account when we first started in 1 Kings chapter 3, where there were two women in the house. Both had babies three days apart. But one rolled over on her baby, killed the baby uh, at nighttime, took the dead baby, put it in the woman's bosom who was sleeping also in the bed and took her live baby put it in her bosom and the next day this lady was claiming that's your baby that's dead and this is my baby the one that's alive and of course we know the story for Solomon did now notice the woman who would who would have rather to give that baby to this other woman knowing that that was her child than to be cut in half by Solomon Telling his men, that's the good mother. Now the ones that said, cut it up, cut the baby in half, so I can get part and she can get part. That was a bad mother. Now let me show you the difference. A good mother, Proverbs 14 and verse number one. If you have your Bible, the book of Proverbs, chapter 14, and verse number one, the Bible says this. Proverbs 14 and 1. Look what the Word of God tells us about a good mother. Every wise woman buildeth her house, but the foolish plucketh it down with her hand. How many times, brothers and sisters, have you seen mothers, I mean mothers who are supposed to be intelligent, tear down their own house instead of using wisdom? The book says one that is wise, they build up their house. But the foolish woman or the bad mother, she tears down her house. Look again at Proverbs chapter 31. Who could find? All right, Proverbs 31. Who can find, verse 10, who could find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. Watch this now. Now, drop down to verse 10. From verse 10 to verse 12, the heart of her husband, rather, doth safely trust in her, so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of his life. And then turn to verse 25 to verse 28. Now here we're talking about a virtuous woman. 25, strength and honor are her clothing. She shall rejoice in times to come. She opened her mouth with wisdom, and her tongue is the law of kindness. She looketh well to the ways of her household, and eateth not the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Notice this, a good woman. Women like, notice this, Sarah, Abigail, Mary, Ruth, Priscilla, Darker, Phoebe, people all of these women were good mothers, were good women. 
who saw the need to do good and they did good. They did not tear down their house with their own hand. They built it up. But then, that's a bad one. That's a bad mother. Mothers like Potiphar's wife, Jezebel, Seretz. She was Haman's wife. Herodias, Sapphira. All of these are bad women. I want you to notice the book of Job. Let me show you what I mean by a mother who really doesn't realize of her responsibility. The book of Job, chapter 39, verse 13 through 17. Now, what I want to do is read these verses in the NIV. Look what it says in Job 39, verses 13 through verse number 17. The wings of an ostrich flap joyfully, though they cannot compare with the wings and feathers of the stork. She lays her eggs on the ground. Now, now notice, it's talking about an ostrich mother, a female ostrich. She lays her eggs on the ground and let them warm in the sun, in the sand, unmindful that a foot may crush them that some wild animal may trample them. She treats her young harshly as if they were not hers. She cares not that her labor was in vain, for God did not endow her with wisdom or give her a share of good sense. What are you trying to say, Brother Medlock? <laughs> Brother Sus, let me tell you about an ostrich. An ostrich is the largest and the largest bird in the world. It has feathers, but it cannot fly. Now, oftentimes people make some assumptions about the ostrich. Number one, they say that an ostrich hides its head in sand. That's not true, that's a myth. See, an ostrich, an adult ostrich will grow to about seven to nine feet tall. And many times they will hold their head near the ground and people have taken that tendency for the ostrich to hold their head to the ground as having their head in the sand. But that's only a myth. But let me tell you a truth about most female ostriches. They are terrible mothers. Did you hear that? Ostrich females, most of them are terrible mothers. They will have eggs of their babies and they just put a little sand over them that people can walk by and crush them or wild animals can find them and feast on them. They, cre they treat their young as, as, as if they don't even know who they are. They are bad mothers. Most female ostrich are bad mothers. Brothers and sisters, I need to tell you something. We got some human mothers that act like female ostriches. Let me show you what I mean. There are some young ladies that will have babies. And they, they're just too busy to take care of their own children. So they'll let their mother or somebody else take care of their children. And the baby will get so used to the other person, the other female, taking care of their children. The baby will start calling that female that's taking care of them, mama. The baby's confused. What I'm trying to say is, we got a lot of bad mothers in the world. Although the good mothers outnumber the bad mothers, we do have some bad mothers in the world. And I don't know about you, but I've actually seen where the baby confused will call the mother, the grandmother, or the, they call them big mama, mama. And that shouldn't be. An ostrich, female ostrich, is a terrible mother, most of them. And what I'm saying is, there's a difference between being a good mother and a bad mother. All right, now that we've seen that difference, notice this also now. Notice this. When it comes to the principle of doing what God would have us to do, and being that, that type of hand that rocks the cradle. Watch this now. Finally, what can a mother do to
to develop the right kind of quality that need to be used in influencing the world in a positive way. What can they do? What can this mother do to be a good mother? Not a bad mother, but a good mother. I want you to give me five quick principles. Here they are. Number one, a good mother will make sure her character is godly so that she can remember to pass on the good thing. Did you hear that? A good mother needs to remember if she's going to be a good mother that she has got to have some godly traits. Her character must be godly and goodly so that she can pass it on to those children that she's taking care of so they can use and just carry on like a domino effect. Turn, if you will, to Judges chapter 2. Judges chapter 2, verse 6 through verse number 10. Judges chapter 2, 6 through 10. The book of Judges, now look at chapter 2. The Bible says this, starting at verse 6. And when Joshua had let the people go, the children of Israel went every man unto his inheritance to possess the land. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great work of King, him part of the sea and all of this incredible thing God had done that he did for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died being 110 years old. Now, to expedite time, drop down to verse number 10. And also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers. They died. And there arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the work which he had done for Israel. Question. How is it possible that God could split the Red Sea, split the Jordan River, done all of these incredible miracles and taking care of the children of Israel, taking care of them like a hen would take care of his baby. As they happen, and another generation will come on the scene and will not even know about what God had done. Here's the answer. The people failed to pass on what they had learned about God. And what we're saying is this. Oftentimes, mother, if you're going to be characterized as a good mother, you've got to pass on some good principles some things that are found in the Word of God. You can't be passing on stuff, well, this is how we do it in, in my house. No, 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 no. No, you pass on principles that are found in the Word of God. You may up and talk some stuff, but you can't go by that stuff that people tell you. You go by what the Word of God is teaching. And when you pass it on, that will develop that child, notice, into a stronger person and that person can probably eventually start ruling the world so number one you want to pass on the things that you have learned notice ezekiel in the book of ezekiel chapter 16 43 and 44 look at the word of god will tell us about those mothers and people in general who pass on bad ideas because there are a lot of women unfortunately who will go by what they have been taught by their parents that that's wrong instead of going by what the Word of God said that's right. Ezekiel chapter 16, look at 43 and 44. Look what the Word of God tells us. Watch this. Ezekiel 16, 43, 44. Because thou hast not remembered the days of thy youth, but thou fretted me in all these things, behold, therefore I also will recompense thy way upon thine head, said the Lord God. And thou shalt not commit this rudeness above all thine abominations. Now look at verse 44. Behold, everyone that useth proverbs shall use this proverb against thee, saying, As is the mother, so is her daughter. Brothers and sisters, have you ever heard the song, She Got It From My Mama? Okay, that could be good or bad. So what I'm saying is, mother, if you're going to be good mother, Use principles that are found in the Word of God and pass those principles on. Don't pass on principles that are only sound, that sounds good, 
but are not based on the word of God. All right? That's the first principle. Second principle, another principle that women and mothers can adopt to help themselves develop into a good mother so that they can pass these qualities on. Here, listen up now. Mothers, you must not be a helicopter mother. Now, I'm going to let that sink in. Mothers, don't be a helicopter mother. Well, Brother Metlock, what is a helicopter mother? First of all, I want you to understand this. A helicopter hovers up. You've seen a helicopter around areas it flies away but it's going to hover around certain areas for a period of time and then it'll probably land but when we say a helicopter mother that's a person that's trying to take care of everything in the life of their children did you hear that a helicopter mother it'll start off when they're young and it still goes on when they are adults Deuteronomy 32 and verse number 11. The book of Deuteronomy, the, the book of Romans 15 says, 15 4, whatsoever things were written before time were written before I learned. Let's learn some things from this principle here. Deuteronomy 22 and verse Deuteronomy 20, 32. 32, I'm sorry. I said 22, but I meant 32. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, Deuteronomy 32, watch this. 32, verse number 11. And as the eagle stirred up her nest, fluttering over her young, spreadeth abroad her wings, taketh them, bears them on her, uh, on her wings. Now there are two phrases or two principles I want you to notice. When eagles are raising their young, young eagles will get to a point where they can fly. Now the mother knows they can fly. But the young don't know that they can fly. And they'll stay in that nest and wait for their mother to go out and get food. And so the mother eagle will do this. She'll start taking straw out of that nest and put sharp limbs in that nest. So when that babies try to get comfortable, moving to the left or the right, those sharp limbs will stick them. And it'll start hurting that baby. In other words, the mother's trying to say, it's time for you to go. You can't stay here all the time. You can fly. You can go out and get your own family. It's time for you to leave. The word stir in the Hebrew means to bring sharp limbs and put them in the nest and start sticking the baby so the baby will get, get the word that, hey, you know, maybe she want me to get out of here. Also, notice it says this. Abroad her wings, take it them, bear it them on her wings. Also, the mother would take these young eagles up way up in the sky and drop them. Now, this baby's got to either start flapping or die. Now, the mother is flying way off so the baby can't see her because she wanted that baby to think that, you know, hey, I got to do something. So, I need to start flapping my wings. Now, what's the point, Brother Metlock? A helicopter mother is a mother who's trying to do everything for their children. Now, helicopter mother, let me ask you a question. I hope this didn't happen to you, but did your mother do you that way? Now, if she did, then you're not going to have a lot of things that you're responsible for, and you're not going to know how to take care of a lot of things. Brothers and sisters, what I'm saying with this helicopter mother, if you want to be a good mother, don't be a helicopter mother. You have got to start doing things and allowing that child to do things for themselves. Look at Proverbs chapter 6, verse 6 through 8. The book of Proverbs chapter 6, verse 6 through verse 8. Go to the ant, thou sluggard, consider her ways, and be wise, having no guide overseer or ruler. They provided meat in the summer and gathered her, uh, her food in the harvest. In other words, God has used insects and animals to teach us a lesson. What he's doing here in the book of Deuteronomy is teaching all of those helicopter parents that if you try to do everything for your children, 
instead of allowing them to take individual responsibility. Let me ask you something, helicopter parents and mothers in particular. Do you plan on living our way? Because, see, at some point, you're going to have to pass out the scene. And when you pass out the scene, if you don't, if you haven't given your children the opportunity to grow up and learn about life, oh, they're going to bump their heads over and over and over and over again. In other words, we don't need helicopter mothers. Teach your children responsibility. And you teach them responsibility by allowing them from time to time to bump their head. Notice, notice I didn't say kill themselves, but I did say to bump their head. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 2 to verse 5, watch this. Galatians chapter 6, watch even the Apostle Paul. Galatians chapter 6, verse 2 and then verse 5, the Bible says this. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so feel the law of Christ. Now drop down to verse 6. Well, five, brother, five. For every man shall bear his own burden. Now you may be saying, well, Brother Metlock, those verses are contradicting one another. No, they're not. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, this verse where it says, bear ye one another burden, it's talking about a large stone that two men need to pick up at the same time. One person can't pick up it by themselves. But in verse 5, when it says, for every man shall bear his own burden, what that verse is saying is just simply this in the original language. A backpack should be carried only by one person. There are some burdens that our children need to bear. And if you are doing everything for them, let me say that again. If you are doing or trying to do everything for them, mothers, let me ask you a question. When are they going to grow up? When are, when are they going to grow up? You are not going to be there always. At, they need to bump their head while you are there at a distance so they can be prepared for this world when they are there by themselves. So number two, if you want to be a good mother, don't be a helicopter mother. Number three, the third principle that mothers can develop to help them become good mothers is to learn the principle of forgiveness. To learn the principles of forgiveness. There are too many families that are being ripped apart right now because some stuff that was done in the past and somebody is passing on some stuff that they should have let go a long time ago. In Philippians chapter 3 and verse 13, look what the Word of God will tell us. Philippians 3.13. The Apostle Paul <clears throat> wrote this. Philippians 3.13. Philippians 3 and, and verse 13. Yeah, here we go. Philippians 3.13. The Bible says this. <clears throat> Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth into those things which are before. Paul is simply saying this. You and I, got to learn to forgive. I want to ask a question this morning. How many homes where some stuff was done, I, I don't know what it was, but some stuff was done 20, 30, maybe 40, 50 years ago, and mothers have passed it on to the children. And now the children hate the individual that committed that act. And the sad part about it is that the whole truth wasn't told. You know, if you ever look at a coin, you know, a coin, a quarter, or a dime, or a penny, it has two sides. Oftentimes, only one side has been told. And we look at the word forgiveness. I think the word forgiveness literally means this in the original Greek language. Not allowing what was done in the past to affect my present nor my future. Did you hear that? To not allow what was done in the past to affect my present nor my future. What we're saying is, if you want to be a good mother and continue to grow 
and, and lead your children up and help them to, to, to make a powerful influence in the world, we've got to learn to forgive. Number four, the fourth principle that mothers can develop to help them uh, to grow up and to be good mothers who will never, never rock the cradle and send out the wrong person to influence the world. You should not show favoritism. Let me say, I, I brought my own amen. Amen, Brother Matlock. Don't show favoritism. What do you mean by that, Brother Matlock? Turn to Genesis 37, 1 through 4. In Genesis 37, verses 1 through verse number 4. Genesis 37, verse 1 through verse 4. Watch what the Word of God says. And Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a slave, in the land of Canaan. These were the generation of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren. And the lad was with the sons of Bilhah, and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought it to his father their evil report. Brother, brother, I'll tell you something now. Joseph was a talented. Now look at verse 3. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all the children, because he was his son in his old age. Did you hear that? And now Israel loved Joseph more than all the children his children because he was his son and his old age and he made him a coat of many colors and when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all of his brethren they hated him they hated him mothers if you want to show and be a good mother as you rock that cradle because possibly the person in the cradle will end up having a positive influence in the world, don't show favoritism. Because not only will you have problems in that house, that thing will go on and on to the other households when those children get grown. And one day, somebody's going to get mad and going to say something like this. You always was her faith. And then you talking about getting it on? Oh, it's going to be they're going to get it on then. And it may not be one person. And then, not only that, in the household of the person, that spouse will start noticing that that mother who's still living is showing favoritism to her husband, that husband or the wife. And it's going to cause all kinds of problems. What I'm saying, favoritism. We can see it in the Word of God, and you can see it today. You may even know a family where a mother is showing more favor toward one member of that family than the other. I'm going to tell you something. If that continues, hate will develop between those kids. So don't get caught up in this favoritism. And last but not least, finally, Mothers, if you want to develop into a good mother by, as you rock that cradle, pass the qualities of a, being a woman of the Word of God, being a woman of the book. What do you mean, Brother Metlock? Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse number 5. 2 Timothy, the chapter is 1 and verse number 5. Watch what the Apostle Paul wrote. When I call to remember, now this is Paul, the unfringed faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, I am persuaded that in thee it dwells in thee also. Paul was writing to Timothy, to Timothy, and he was saying that the qualities that you have gotten, when you, Timothy, when you were in the cradle, when your mother and your grandmother was rocking you, they were women of the book, and they instilled in you the book, the Word of God. You see, the Bible tells us that we ought to be people of faith. And in Romans 10, 17, it says, Now faith comes by hearing, and hearing the Word of God. As we conclude this lesson for today, may all of the mothers, single and married, take these words as 
you work to, to pass on the positive principle so that you can help those who are in the cradle. Because you see, you need to understand this. Somebody may be watching you. Let me read this poem to you as we end this lesson. I watched him walk in the way of life with heart and head held high. It always seemed my low grew light whenever he passed by. I patterned everything I did by what I saw him do. That he loved God, I would not doubt, because his life was true. I often wish that more like his, my way of life might be. Imagine my surprise to find that he's been watching me. As I end this lesson, the principle of the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. It's evident in every facet of our lives. What I'm saying is, think about what God has been telling us all this morning. It's not Brother Metlock's opinion, but it's what the Word of God is actually teaching. Now at this time, we come to the end of our lesson. If you are listening by means of this broadcast and you're not a Christian, the Bible teaches that you come by hearing the gospel, believing it, repenting of your sins, confessing Christ, then being baptized for the washing away of your sins. There are those who would like to make that a reality right now. You can call us at area code 229-894-7094. Again, that's area code 229-890-7094. Also, there are those who would like to contact us here at the church. You can contact us at area code 229-436-9667. And if there are those who would like to email us, you can email us at us19cocsouth at gmail.com. And just before we dismiss, we're going to ask everyone to bow as our leader in a word of prayer. Eternal Father, we come to you at this time and we end this lesson for the day. We pray, Father, that the things that we talked about were things that people would really understand. That these are not just man's opinions, but these are the teachings of the Word of God. And we know, Father, to please you, we must do those things that are found within your Word and follow your teachings. And now that we depart from this place, but not that present, we pray that you'll be the means to break us back to the next appointed time. For we ask this to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us all say, Amen. And now until next Sunday, may God bless you in a very, very special way. Don't forget to be safe. Thank you.